while we're about to get started here in just a couple of minutes, we still have some people who are looking for seats. So could everyone who is here, and if someone is saving a seat for you, please take your seats. And then if there is a space next to you, I encourage you to fill that space. And then if you could raise your hand and let us know if there is space for someone else to sit in your row, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, balcony folks. I think there are a couple of seats still in the balcony. Hi everyone, thank you so much for squeezing in. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Dean's Meeting for Arts and Sciences. I'm proud to introduce Dean of Arts and Sciences, Feng Zhang Hu, and Vice Dean of Undergraduate Education, Aaron McLaughlin. Good morning. Let's try again. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome parents, families, and loved ones of the class of 2027. It is wonderful to see all of you here on our beautiful campus on this warm yet gorgeous day as your students begin their journey at Washington University. I am Feng Shenghu, Dean of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a professor in the Department of Biology and the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. I joined WashU just over three years ago, but like you, before I even set foot on campus, I knew Washington University was a special place. In the past three years, I've had abundant opportunities to directly observe just how exceptional it is as a higher education institution. Today is such a special day. I know you're excited and I am truly excited too. For months now, my colleagues and I have been eagerly awaiting and preparing for the arrival of the class of 2027 and their Finally, finally here. The WashU community is filled with amazing people and opportunities. And now with you and your students joining our community, it will become even better. We have a rich and informative presentation for you today. So I'm gonna keep my remarks brief. I wanna make three points. First is that WashU students are simply some of the best people in the world. I say this as someone 
who has been a member of multiple institutions across the United States, and in fact, across the globe. Our students are world-class academically, of course, you know that, but they're also some of the most conscientious, caring, and passionate people. Every student I have met at WashU is the kind of person who truly gives you hope for the future. Second, we take care of our students at WashU. I and all other WashU leaders do every part of our jobs with their best interests in mind. I understand that you are filled with many mixed emotions right now. As a father who currently has two children in college, I can certainly appreciate that you are feeling intense pride, excitement, and maybe even some anxiety, especially if your student will be far from home. So I want to try to put your mind at ease. At WashU, we are always, always here for our students. Helping them thrive is a central part of our mission. In arts and sciences, they will study the fundamentals, of course, but they will also have plenty of opportunities to explore new ideas and new areas. Your students' academic experience will be broad and expansive and they will also gain deep knowledge in fields that intrigue them. We will prepare, prepare your students to build fulfilling and successful lives, not only in the years ahead, but right now, right here on our campus. And that brings me to my third point. Your students' future is incredibly bright. Our alumni are going to do amazing things. They are scholars, medical doctors, entrepreneurs, teachers, business leaders, public servants, you just name it. They are even Nobel laureates and Pulitzer Prize winners who have garnered worldwide recognition. And they are indispensable contributors who work tirelessly behind the scenes, making the world a better place. We look forward to your students joining their ranks one day the year they will spend at WashU will inspire them and they inspire us. Now I'm gonna use a few slides to tell you a bit about the School of Arts and Sciences. I know you've mostly been thinking about your students' majors, minors, and their academic departments. So what is Arts and Sciences? Simply put, we are WashU's home for the liberal arts. So on the slide here, I have a number of statistics. First of all, we are the largest school. On the Danforth campus, the main campus of WashU, we teach literally 100% of the undergraduate students at WashU. The School of Arts and Sciences has roughly 60% of the undergraduate majors and we have about 60% of the professors on campus as well. The School of Arts and Sciences contributes disproportionately to the, the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion. So we have a greater percentage of URM faculty and URM students. URM stands for underrepresented minority uh, so we have a greater percentage than any other schools on campus. So on the lower left here, uh, a number of statistics. So we have a total of roughly 4,800 undergraduate students in arts and sciences. That means three out of five WashU undergraduates are in arts and sciences. We offer 70 major areas of studies across 44 departments and programs. And my swipe card, gives me access to 42 buildings. This basically means that the 42 buildings are the homes of our departments and programs. And we have a total physical footprint of roughly 750,000 square feet. So if you go out to the campus, most of the buildings that you see are arts and sciences buildings. What I want to do next is to uh, tell you a bit about our new strategic plan. So 
I was a new dean just three years ago, and people always ask me, what's your vision for the School of Arts and Sciences? And I always told people that this is such an important school, it's so big and so complex, it would be truly presumptuous for me to say that my ideas are the school's vision, but I did tell people that as we turn to the next 10 years, we envision a transformed school that will serve as a global model for a premier school of arts and sciences. And we will do so by leading innovative developments in a range of critical fields and disciplines, advancing foundational knowledge and convergent breakthroughs, creating solutions for pressing global challenges, and educating a new generation of leaders to shape the future and change the world. So that becomes our vision statement now. Uh, what I want to do next is to show you a short video that hopefully captures the high level of enthusiasm and excitement that our community has for this, for this new strategic plan. Our campus sits near the confluence of two ancient rivers. Ecosystems merge and thrive in our midst. Our region has seen diverse cultures take root, fight for survival, and reach toward greatness. A host of resources, historical and cultural, innovative and intellectual, enrich our work. They draw us to engage with our city with each other and with communities around the globe. Our school, Arts and Sciences, represents a convergence of ideas, ideas that shape our understanding of the world and indeed the world itself. We will elevate scholarship that is creative and ambitious by embracing new ideas, emerging technologies, and shifting paradigms. We will honor and promote the pursuit and discovery of knowledge. We will seek distinction in cutting edge scholarship and push boundaries both within and among disciplines to meet the most critical challenges facing our communities and our planet. We will find new ways to tell our story, to share the matter and meaning behind our work. We are an institution devoted to bringing people together to serve the public good. Our partnerships here in St. Louis and across the region will identify shared goals, and we will pursue academic and educational excellence that positively impacts our communities. We will forge critical connections from the local to the global, expanding solutions, and imparting lasting impacts on the world within our own community faculty, staff, and students of all identities will feel valued, represented, and equally empowered to pursue their goals. Here, we'll create meaningful connections with our peers, our mentors, and the St. Louis community. We will gather knowledge and learn how to apply it to build lives filled with meaning and purpose. We will go out into the world as engaged, active, 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 active and impactful members of our communities. Together, our voices will rise to shape the next decade and all the decades to come. We are ready. The time is now. Welcome to the decade of arts and sciences. Thank you, that gives me goosebumps every time. <laughs> so your students, the class of 2027, are in for a wonderful four years. We are so delighted to have them here. 
and we are thrilled to welcome you, their families and loved ones, to the Washu community. Thank you all so much for entrusting us with your students and congratulations on this momentous occasion. With that, please allow me to introduce my colleague, Vice Dean Aaron McLaughlin, who oversees our liberal arts curriculum and the undergraduate college of arts and sciences. Dr. McLaughlin is a renowned Holocaust scholar. She's also deeply, deeply committed to undergraduate education and the success of our students. She will be your students' greatest champion during the time here. And I know she's so excited to meet all of you. Please join me in welcoming Vice Dean Aaron McLaughlin. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dean Hu. Uh, as Dean Hu mentioned, I'm Vice Dean Aaron McLaughlin, and I lead the undergraduate area of arts and sciences, also known as the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a professor of German and Jewish studies, and I've been at WashU for exactly 22 years. So my absolute favorite time of year is the beginning of the fall semester, when the excitement on campus is palpable. We're all embarking on a new year with all the promise and anticipation that that brings. That sense of an open vista of unlimited possibilities is particularly true for our newest students who have the whole WashU world open to them. I'm so excited to greet them, to get to know them, and to support them on their academic journey. As I mentioned, I represent the college office, a dedicated team of advising and student academic affairs professionals whose mission it is to support students and foster their success. And I'm joined here today by a few of uh, the uh, uh, amazing staff of the college office. They're there in the back. They probably helped you find seats um, and they, they'll be here to answer questions uh, afterward. And, and so I just briefly want to introduce uh, Robert Campbell, who's our Associate Dean and Director of Student Academic Affairs. I'd also like to introduce Jennifer Romney, who's Associate Dean of Administration and Policy. And Wilmetta Tolivir Giallo, who is Senior Assistant Dean of Postgraduate and Pre-Professional Advising. So, I, they're here today to show you that we are here uh, for your students. Uh, I know that you, uh, as parents and families, are also incredibly, uh, sorry, I'm behind on my slide, I think, no, yes, uh, are also incredibly excited about this moment. Although perhaps your feelings of anticipation are mixed with worries and concerns. I'm here to acknowledge your feelings, but also to give you information to reassure you and tips to help you navigate this first year. After all, this is a big moment in your students' lives. They're about to bark on, embark on their four-year academic journey, which is an intense, exciting period in a young adult's life. It's a time of intellectual exploration, of awakening knowledge of oneself and the physical and social world one inhabits and of personal transformation. In arts and sciences, we see this as an academic journey, a gradual process of development in which students come into their own and identify their passions, interests, and career goals. Tomorrow, I'll talk to the first year students about the idea of the journey and ask them to mark the occasion by writing postcards to their future selves, the selves that they'll uh, be when they graduate. So they'll get these postcards back in three and a half years. Uh, naturally, when one starts a completely new endeavor, there is bound to be some degree of anxiety. This is normal and to be expected, but I'd like to take you through the main kinds of anxiety that students and parents feel and give you some strategies for managing them. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to talk to you about a couple of things. First, sorry, first I'll talk about some of the common sources of anxiety for both students and parents in the transition to college, including choosing a major, overcommitment, 
grades. Uh, and then I'll talk about the productive role that families can play in student success. At the end, we'll also try to leave some time for your questions. So let's get to it. The first source of anxiety for both students and their families is choosing a major. Students often enter college with the idea that they must have already identified a single passion or academic objective, that one major path or uh, course of study that will define their lives and solidify their future. This notion of a singular passion, the sole clearly defined thing that has to play out in a particular way for the student to be eternally happy, puts a lot of pressure on students. And it often closes them off to the many possibilities around them. We in the College of Arts and Sciences see this in another way. We see the entrance into college as the beginning of a dynamic process, a journey that may have a definite destination, but that also contains spontaneous side trips and serendipitous moments of discovery. And also, like all serious endeavors, can, can contain occasional setbacks and moments of doubt. For this reason, we want to stress right off the bat that this is just the beginning and that students don't have to have it all figured out right now. In fact, nearly half of our undergraduate students enter WashU without knowing what they want to study. Many of those who don't know, comparing themselves with their new friends and roommates, might feel anxiety or embarrassment about this. But we actually encourage our students not to be too hasty in making decisions about what their academic goals will be without trying things out and exploring subjects that they previously had no experience with. Arts and Sciences, as Dean Hu indicated, has a multitude of disciplines and courses that were simply not even available to students in their high schools. And in fact, there is plenty of time and space built into our curriculum for trying things out. Students don't actually need to declare a major until the second semester of their sophomore year. And even after that, they can add some majors and minors. Further, all of our students will be required to engage with a true liberal arts and sciences curriculum. They'll be exposed to different ways of thinking, new perspectives, and academic areas that are unknown to them. The IQ curriculum encourages them to explore, especially in their first year. And at the same time, this exploration can satisfy various core requirements so that time and energy spent delving into new areas do not foreclose any possible paths. They are fully compatible with finishing on time and making the necessary preparations for particular uh, careers or for graduate study. Moreover, students shouldn't stress out about their major anyway. As studies have consistently shown, an applicant's major isn't the main qualification that employers focus on. Rather, they're seeking applicants with a broad range of skills and literacies such as communication, critical thinking, data analysis, and ethical judgment. As you can see from this graphic from a 2021 survey of 496 employers, the fluencies and skills students gain in a strong liberal arts and sciences education are highly desired by employers in a range of industries. Of course, particular content or expertise, uh, particular content expertise or courses will be important for some paths, but in those paths too, such as the study of medicine, and I think a couple of you, maybe one or two have students who are interested in this, there is a great deal of focus on applicants who are well-rounded and who can think and communicate. We have a strong structure in place to help students identify possible interests, articulate a study plan, and think about how their studies will connect to their post-college life. In any case, students won't screw things up by choosing the wrong major. This is supported by career outcomes of our graduates. 
If you're interested in possible career paths of a particular major and the ways in which alums who graduated with that major have fared in the working world, I encourage you to review the career outcome data available on the Career Center we website. You can filter by school and department to see reported outcomes and destinations for WashU students. Students shouldn't avoid choosing a major because they're worried about their future career choice. We can help them make it work. In fact, we want to get students thinking about future career paths right away. We encourage them to get, engage early and often with the WashU Career Center and to explore possible careers through the Career Center exercises and workshops. In fact, we'll already start talking about this stuff in our arts and sciences orientation sessions this coming week. Even those students who do not, who do have clear objectives, such as taking the pre-health or pre-med path, can choose diverse majors in the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. They do not need to major in biology to get into med school. Successful pre-med students major in a variety of areas. This is exemplified in our own student body. Every year, we have about 350 WashU students apply to med school. Most of them are arts and sciences students. And we actually see no difference in admissions rates between those who major in biology and those who major in other fields, such as anthropology, chemistry, Spanish, economics, classics, psychology, and history, to name just a few majors. And many of these majors actually have coursework in health adjacent areas. In fact, 25% of successful applicants to medical school have majors and minors outside of the natural sciences. So there are many paths to med school. Whatever path or path students take, they create a narrative for their med school applications that shows how their very studies contribute to the breadth and depth of knowledge important for the practice of medicine. So I kind of got that in there because I, again, a number of students apply to medical school. My, our point with this is, is they get to experience all of arts and sciences as they're, as they're going through our curriculum. They do not need to narrowly focus in on one thing. And in fact, if they do so, that actually hinders their applications. Okay. Um, the second source of study for anxiety and uh, for students and their families is overcommitment. WashU students often feel the need to max out their schedule in terms of both academics and extracurricular activities. They easily subscribe to the culture of busy and believe that there's something wrong with them if they're not overcommitted at all times. Our students developed this mindset and formed these habits when they prepared to apply for college. As all of you very well know, many of them felt the need to do more in order to win the college admissions race. But now they're here at WashU. They don't need to pr prove that same quantity of engagement. There's really no recipe for winning college, but we frequently see that students believe that they have to prove themselves in all possible areas. And they add things to their schedules merely for the sake of adding them to their schedules. If they love the activities they're doing, this is fine. But if they're doing this out of habit or because of external pressures, that's a problem. Especially in the first semester, they should slow down and focus on getting acclimated they should avoid overcommitting themselves until they understand the academic expect expectations being made of them and they get uh, used to the rhythm and the routine of the semester. When they do add more activities or a heavy schedule of coursework, they should do these things for meaning and to de develop skills. They should try to be intentional in their choices. And in this regard, quality should win out over quantity. The third uh, source of anxiety for parents and students is unexpected grades, which for our students usually means grades other than A's. It's true. <laughs> you know them, we know them. We're all on the same page here. So adjustment to college can take a little time for first year students. The expectations are different. The material is different. The rhythm of the semester is different. 
But many first year courses allow for that adjustment by having early exams that give feedback to students and by, and by building in problem and discussion sections that help students digest the material. A large majority of our students was in the top 10% of their high school class. But WashU is a different playing field and it can take some time for students to adjust their habits in order to work with different expectations and a different peer group. A rough exam uh, or course grade, particularly in the first year, does not ruin a student's trajectory or their opportunities to, uh, to achieve their career goals. In fact, and this I'm just gonna go quickly to our pre-med students again, the average GPA of our students who get into medical school is 3.4. It's not actually, it's not, uh, you know, that is, that includes a lot of B's and some C's. So students do not have to have a 4.0 to have a successful postgraduate path. But of course, most students are bound to get grades that they hoped would have been better. Learning to navigate this issue in productive ways is a part of the learning curve of the college experience for both students and their families. And there are unhelpful responses to unexpected grades and there are helpful ones. So I'm gonna start with the unhelpful responses to unexpected grades. One unhelpful response is deciding that an unexpected grade automatically means that one is not good at a subject. In fact, most subjects ask students to learn new skills and grow abilities in particular areas. And this takes time and effort. We don't want students assuming that one disappointing grade or tough assignment is the final judgment on their abilities or their potential and then simply giving up. They need to know this is hard stuff sometimes, but it, they can get it and it takes time and effort to do so. Another unhelpful response is asking the students to, to study harder or longer. But increasing the time spending, uh, spent studying will prop, probably not bring about a decisive change in their per performance, unless, of course, they didn't study to begin with. And that's another question. Rather, students typically find that they need to rethink the way they study and to learn new study skills. A lot of our high achieving students do not have effective study habits. They were able to get, a go, get away with being inefficient in high school, but they realized that they need to change those habits now. Being deliberate about study habits can be a game changer for our students. By learning effective study habits, students can often either improve their performance or achieve the same performance with less time. We repeat this advice over and over again, and it takes sometimes a while for it to penetrate. So it's good when the advice comes not just from us, but from various sources, including from families. And then, and this is where we hope you come in as well, there are more helpful responses to unexpected grades. First, it's important to ask the student what they could do differently they themselves may have some insight into why they're not performing as well as they would like. And partnering with them to think through the issue can be very helpful. Second, it's also important to encourage students to use the many resources that are available to them on campus. Some students think that availing themselves of the resources available to them somehow constitutes an admission of failure. But in fact, from the perspective of faculty and advisors, it demonstrates the student's determination and their maturity. These resources include the instructor. Students often feel embarrassed coming to faculty. They feel either instruct, the instructor won't want to help them or again, that this demonstrates some kind of weakness. But in fact, there is nothing that a professor likes more than to see a str struggling student come in for help. We don't judge them, rather we want to help students to do their best. And we're impressed by students who take the initiative to learn better or who express real interest in the subject matter. Then there is the learning center, which can provide support for particular courses or with general study skills. There's the writing center, which can help students navigate the different kinds of writing assignments required in various courses. 
and they help even the most polished writer take their writing to the next level. Then there is our Disability Resources Office for students with learning disorders or ADHD. Some students already received accommodations for learning disorders in high school. And if they had those accommodations, they should definitely go through our process to receive them again. This is not the time to change the game on this or to take away particular strategies. Some students deal with undiagnosed learning disabilities. It is not uncommon for students to get a diagnosis in their first or second year of college. In fact, almost half of students with accommodations get their diagnoses after high school. So if students or families suspect that this is a persistent issue, they should definitely consult with disability resources. Then there are advisors. As many of you already know, WashU places a strong emphasis on academic advising and has put into place a matrix of advisors, which means that each student has a network of people who can help them with both academic and personal matters. The core of comprehensive advising, uh, of our comprehensive advising program is the four-year advisor who is assigned to the student in the summer before they matriculate. Your students have already interacted with their four-year advisors over the summer, and they'll be meeting again tomorrow and several times during the first year. As the advising title indicates, these advisors accompany the students throughout their college career and meet with them a minimum of a once of a semester after the first year. They're there to ensure academic continuity over the entire four years. Because this long, kind of long-standing advising relationship may be new to many of our students, our four-year advising team has put together a handout that they share with students that lays out the expectations of both students and four-year advisors in building the advising relationship. If that's something you'd like to review, you can link to it through the QR code on the screen. Then there are departmental advisors. Uh, where when students declare a major or a minor, they add a specialist advisor from those programs. And these advisors, many of whom are faculty, help with dis discipline specific courses and the ins and outs of ma uh, majors and minors. We also have a post uh, robust postgraduate advising in, uh, structure. If, those, if our students are pre-professional, pre-law, pre-grad or pre-health, they receive advisors in those areas as well. Further, there are study abroad advisors. Students in plan, planning on engaging in an international experience are advised by staff in the overseas programs office who advise on the logistics of study abroad and by study abroad advisors within particular majors or minors who can make sure that the study abroad works with the students' study plans. Faculty not only serve as major and minor advisors, but they also serve as mentors, both formally with research projects and advice on postgraduate study and informally. Outside the college office, there are student affairs professionals who support residential life, campus life, student health, et cetera. And finally, there are peer advisors available, including RAs in the res residential halls, WUSAs, these, the students you see in the red t-shirts running around campus, and peer mentors in particular subjects like math and chemistry. Students can thus rely on an entire campus network that is in place to help them negotiate any academic or personal challenges they face. And I really think of this network as a net. It's woven really tightly with this whole group of people so that nobody, the idea is that nobody falls through the cracks. In addition to this extended network of support available to students here at WashU, we recognize that families also play an important role in ensuring the well being and success of their students. The support of families is critical for the development of students, and we find it important to partner with families. After all, we have a common interest in helping our students flourish. But the key to the partnership is the role that the students play in this venture. For, this, for us, the student is the primary agent in the relationship. 
It is critical that the student be in the driver's seat of their own educational experience and that they own and take responsibility for their academic path. We think that students are best supported by both WashU faculty and staff and their parents. However, we don't circumvent the student to work directly with families. We honor the student's agency and their educational path and make sure that their desires and needs are at the center of our focus. Parents are understandably concerned about their students and want to be involved, but this requires that parents work with the student not for them. This is where we want to avoid the phenomenon of helicoptering and over-involvement in the students' academic and social lives. We want students to become independent and responsible and to emerge from their four years here as capable adults who are able to fully function in society. This means that they'll need to learn that to navigate challenges for themselves. Of course, we'll support them in this, but ultimately the student needs to be the one shaping their destiny and owning their own educational experience. When I use the term helicoptering, you may think of helicopters constantly circling the Danforth campus like they do actually do at our med school. In fact, after I gave this presentation to last year's families, a parent got a kick out of the image of a helicopter hovering over campus and <laughs> made and sent me this cute picture. I'm not quite sure what to make of the fact that it's a military helicopter, but there we go. But, it, but instead, what I mean by helicoptering is a certain style of parenting in which parents insert themselves into the lives of their, of their emerging adult children to a degree that may hinder the development of coping skills. In the research on the experience of college-age adults, helicoptering is considered to be uniformly counterproductive. Even though parents who engage in helicoptering are often supportive and well-intentioned, students who are helicoptered, who have problems solved by their parents and who themselves do not exert agency or control, have increased levels of depression, increased levels of anxiety, decreased satisfaction with life, decreased physical health, and decreased academic performance. These negative effects occur even though the parental intention is clearly to support rather than harm the student. And I want to stress here that in almost all cases in which we see helicoptering, the student, the, the parents fervently wish to help not hurt their student. So we also almost always assume good intentions even with such negative outcomes. Of course, it's important for families to support their students and to be involved in their lives. Such connection is critical for student success. So how do we know when that positive intention to support veers into the negative area of helicopter parenting? The key is to make this distinction between behaviors and actions that support the autonomy of the students and those that indicate over-involvement in or control of students' lives. So what exactly constitutes helicoptering and what constitutes autonomy supportive behavior? According to research surveys that determine the phenomenon of helicoptering with college age students, there is a difference between parental interaction that supports the autonomy and agency of students and interaction that is overly involved and inappropriate. I've taken examples from both kinds of interaction from the research surveys. I'm gonna read them here and let's see whether you can identify which behavior is autonomy supportive and which is helicoptering. So this is your quiz. Let's hope we all get an A on it. Okay, first of all, number one, parents who want to have a say in which major the student chooses. Two, parents who call the professors about low grades or about assignments. Three, parents who want the student to call or text to let them know where they are. Four, parents who encourage the student to make their own decisions and to take responsibility for the choices they've made. Five, parents who monitor whom the student spends time with. Six, parents who encourage the student to keep a budget and manage their own finances. 
Seven, parents who intervene in a problem with a roommate. And eight, parents who encourage the student to communicate with professors. So which of these behaviors are helicoptering and which are autonomy supportive? All of the helicoptering behaviors, so one, two, three, five, and seven, are italicized. The autonomy supportive ones, four, six, and eight, are bolded. You'll notice that the items that are bolded are all about encouraging students. Those behaviors support the student's agency and allow them to solve challenges independently, even if the parent is giving advice, reassurance, and moral support, all of, all of which our students definitely need at times. According to the research, such, such autonomy supportive parenting is correlated with far better outcomes. We are trying to empower and enable students to advocate for themselves. It takes time and it, it isn't always clear cut, but students do learn to make decisions and deal with the consequences of making those decisions. This is necessary for them to be fully engaged in their education. At the same time, however, we're not advocating for a kind of sink or swim situation. In fact, as evident in the advising matrix I introduced a few moments ago, we've developed a large team of supportive partners throughout campus. We believe in providing students with a great deal of advice, information, and connections, and helping them to develop their skills so that they can flourish. Our approach to advising involves supporting the student's autonomy and enabling them to make positive, informed decisions. We really encourage them to step up and own their education. Just to be clear though, by saying that we want to avoid helicoptering, I'm not saying that we don't wanna hear from parents. In fact, there are appropriate times for parents to make contact with us. So under what circumstances should a family member be involved? When should they contact us? Sometimes it will be useful for us to hear from you if your student is stressed or struggling and you don't know what to do to help or whom they should talk to, or if you wonder whether what your student is going through is even normal in the first place. We generally don't advise that parents bypass students to talk to us except when there is something going on in a student's life that they probably aren't going to tell us about themselves. This could be a family situation, health challenges, or other personal situations. In such instances, you might wanna give us the heads up so that we can check in with the student a bit more frequently. We support students advocating for themselves, but if they have attempted to do so through conventional channels, though through the advisor or the faculty member, and it's not going anywhere and they won't reach out to the, us themselves, then you might want to make contact with us. It's always preferable for the student to talk to us directly, so please encourage them to talk to us. But if the student won't do so, we can strategize together about how to help the student move forward. Conversely, under what circumstances should a family member not be involved? There are definitely less productive or appropriate reasons to call us. A parent should not contact us, for example, when it's a question of information. Uh, for example, how many credits will transfer from a summer program or when the deadlines to add or drop a course are. Students need to learn to handle these things and to find out information and policies for themselves. That's part of being an agent in their own education. Further, a parent shouldn't ask us to tell a student what they need to do. When we get these kinds of requests, the parents often don't want to know the student to know that they reached out to us. That puts us in a bind if we're supposed to check in with the student without acknowledging that we've spoken to the families and they, we know there's an issue. It's actually an impossible dilemma for us. Also, a parent shouldn't reach out to us for information that a student won't give to them. This is where we follow the regulations of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or what's called FERPA. You've probably heard about this a lot lately, which stipulates that anything about a student's academic performance is private to them. We can't talk with, uh, uh, with families about the student's academic record or other information without the student's consent. 
unless there's a significant issue, for example, when a student's status is in jeopardy. Otherwise, we encourage you to talk with the student or we can talk to you with the student, all three of us. In general, we expect that the student will take the initiative to disclose and discuss academic goals and progress with their uh, families. And we encourage you to have that conversation with your students in a low key way often so that you're up to date on what's happening with your student. Finally, and this is actually kind of funny, a parent sometimes contacts us to make sure a student wakes up or gets to class on time. Yes, it happens. You know, parents are people too, right? They get freaked out. This also isn't appropriate for the college as our purview is strictly the academic side of the student's college experience. We actually don't keep tabs on our students outside of class. The staff of Residential Life can help be helpful with your questions about how your student is functioning outside the academic area. But just know that they're also not going to tell your students um, how to get, they're not going to give them wake up calls or, or get them to class on time. That's not going to happen on their part either. Okay, um, I'd like to conclude my presentation here by turning from your communications with us to your students' communications with you. One thing that you might be on the lookout for in the next weeks and months as your student starts to navigate the unknown waters of the new semester is the occasional text or phone call in which the student is panicking or venting about a particular situation. That situation could be a difficult assignment, an unexpected grade, the student's workload, an upcoming test, problems with a roommate, or even just a little homesickness. That happens too. So I'd like you to be prepared for this panicky phone call, which typically sets off a kind of inevitable chain reaction. So this is the chain. One, a bad thing of unknown magnitude happens. Two, the student becomes distressed. Three, the student calls and texts you about their distress, which inevitably worries and upsets you. Four, five minutes after calling or texting, the student goes for late night pizza with their sweet mate and everything's fine. They've gotten over the issue and they're feeling better. Five, the student comes back to their dorm, works on their paper, watches some Netflix and goes into a deep sleep. Six, you become distressed and you lie awake half the night, imagining your child still in despair while your student sleeps peacefully blissfully unaware of your suffering. This shows that students don't always close the loop on their own calls of distress. And we want them to learn that they need to be mindful of what they ask of their families. We want them to also be responsible and considerate in their dealings with you. So tomorrow, I'm also gonna lay out this very scenario to them and remind them that they need to reach out and close the loop again when they feel better, that they cannot leave you hanging. That is cruel and not the way to be that, you know, autonomy, autonomous agent <laughs> that they need to be. We care about what we care about our, about our students holistically, including their relationships with you. So this is what we see as our way of supporting you in your support of the students that we now have um, uh, responsibility for together. OK, so I'm going to end this now. I'm going to open this up for questions. But before I do, I wanted to give you my contact information so that you can contact me anytime for appropriate reasons, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's Weistein McLaughlin at wistel.edu, uh, phone number 314 935 7747, or you can find a lot of information at college at wistel.edu if you want to, if you have a general question. Okay, so um, let's hear what uh, everyone has to say. I've also got my team here to help me out in case I don't know the answer to a question. We have like about 4,000 years of collective wisdom here, so. Okay, are we, Jeff, are we good on the mics? I can hear you. Testing. Is that coming through? It's not, I don't think it's coming through the mic. It is? Okay, oh, there we yes. go. 
All right, yeah, if you just wanna raise your hands, um, we'll, come, we'll try to come around to you and um, ask questions. Hi, um, I have a question. How does the IQ curriculum work? Exactly. <laughs> oh boy, I'm my colleague here who is uh, all IQ all the time. Um, I think she could probably answer this better than I do. I will say though that the IQ curriculum asks students to take courses in particular areas throughout arts and sciences. Um, these are often the areas that um, coincide with students' interest as well. So it's rare that a student can't find a course in, in those areas, in the natural sciences, the social sciences, humanities, language and culture, et cetera. Um, and in fact, we have hundreds of courses that uh, for each of the areas that, um, that satisfy their requirement. There's only one um, a course that all students have to take and that's college writing. Otherwise they get to decide in the plethora of courses we have what they'd like to take. Jennifer, do you wanna to add to that? I think that was perfect. I will say that I will explain it all to them in this very room on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Hi, um, my child has already signed a FERPA uh, for the state of Missouri. So if we send that document into the college, does that fulfill the requirement of FERPA? So uh, with FERPA, there a, a new document has to be created for each person and situation uh, that you need to discuss with us. So um, there, if you uh, go to registrar at wustel.edu, that's the registrar's website. There's information there on FERPA and a form that parents can fill out should they want to talk to us without the student. And the student has to sign the form and tell us exactly what information we can release and to whom. And that means, you know, the information would be, um, for example, I, um, I'm wanting to know about my student's schedule. Again, if you should be able to get that from your student, but if there's some reason you can't, you can um, uh, have the student fill out this form, say you want to speak to the advisor, have the student sign it and submit it, and then um, uh, then we'll be able to talk to you. But there is no blanket FERPA for every situation and for every uh, person. It's pretty specific. Um, following up on that, uh, having the student uh, complete the power of attorney health care, does that provide then uh, the ability for the, us to communicate with health services? If there's so the power of attorney health care, that is not something I'm aware of. That would need to be spoken to with, um, with uh, health services. That would not allow any educational information to be released. I can say that. That has to go through FERPA. Um, do you guys know if the power of attorney health care would um, allow parents to, um, to communicate with staff? I was going to agree with you that you should talk to Habith because they will have the information on what the power of attorney uh, um, health care provides. I know it's really important if the student gets in an emergency health situation. So please um, kind of go to the Habith Wealth uh, website and talk with them about that. Yeah. There's somebody way in the back here, Simone. Oh, okay. I'm on my way. Thank you very much. Well, the website, uh, the the web address that we are supposed to contact. So I don't the know the exact attorney. website, but if you go to, if you just Google Habif, H-A-B-I-F, Wustel, then it should pop up. It's our student health center. And they're also on the South 40. So if you're planning to make your way that way, they also have offices there. Hello. Thank you so much for this information. Um, my question is this, does it mean that for every situation you have to sign a new FERPA? So for example, if I wanna talk about academics, her grades, then she has to sign a FERPA at that time. I thought it was just a one and done. No, it is not a blanket um, uh, thing. It has to be for every situation. We generally do not, the FERPA really means that we have a specific thing that we're uh, that the student authorizes us to talk about with another party. So uh, if you, if there's, we generally, again, would like students to be in the room when we speak with parents. It's generally the best thing not to speak over them or around them. So mm -hmm. if a student brings to you to the meeting, then we don't need to sign FERPA because the student is there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
Good morning or afternoon. Um, how do you handle a student who has no idea what they want to do, doesn't know any, like very ambivalent? towards interest. So the question is, how do we handle a student who doesn't know what they want to do and doesn't know where to start and is ambivalent? That is what we do. That's the normal situation for us. Um, and we have structured exercises in our advising program to help students kind of identify interests um, that they would, would like to pursue. The IQ curriculum is designed to get students into various types of subjects and courses that will help them um, uh, identify some, some pathway. Um, we also partner with the Career Center. If, there, if the student is just really not sure, you know, what we want students to do, especially in this first, first year, is focus on interests and explore new areas. That's what we want to do. But we also want to show that, yes, there is a pathway from each of our majors to a particular career. So we bring in the Career Center for those kinds of questions as well. But it's not it's not untypical for student to really not know what they want to do. I had five advisees that I have last year, none of whom knew what they wanted to do. <laughs> Maybe that's why they were assigned to me. And already they're starting their sophomore year and several of them have figured out a major. They, they know some ideas about what they may want to do uh, if for their careers. A couple have done internships, a couple, a couple have done um, some community service that kind of pushes them in a particular direction. So the opportunities will give your information, your student information on what they like, what they're interested in, et cetera. It, it's kind of, I, I mean, I entered college without a clue and here I am. I mean, it took me a while to get here, but uh, <laughs> here I am. Um, just a quick one. So it seems like the parents are, you know, obviously pretty involved with, with you know, incoming freshmen in terms of being here this weekend and family weekend and possibly even in the spring, maybe, I don't know, helping them move out. But in subsequent years, um, do you see like most parents pretty much not having, not coming out here for all these events and pretty much just letting the kids do their own thing? You know, that's a good question. So the question is, do you, you know, do parents start to maybe taper down their involvement? I, I do think that happens a little bit, but it could happen in, in different ways. So I'm, I'm thinking of a, a student that I had that graduated a couple of years ago. His parents were very involved early on, came to every parent's weekend. Um, then, you know, when he moved off campus, they might, they came at different times. They weren't necessarily coming, they would come to visit him, but wouldn't come to campus events because they, he was doing fine. They, he, they knew they didn't need him to be on campus. We do see a little bit of that tapering off, um, although we encourage students uh, to invite their parents as often as they would like. Um, and we, of course, welcome uh, parents of all students, uh, you know, from the first year to the senior year to our uh, parents weekend. But, you know, as the student kind of develops their life here, it, I, I do think that there is less of a need for that uh, involvement of parents. Definitely. Is anyone, does Robert have any a question upstairs. Oh, great. Checking if there are any questions upstairs. Oh, checking. I hope Anybody? there are questions upstairs. Last chance. All right. Anyone else? Down? Here's one here, Simone. Oh, okay. For those of us who are sending children under our own health insurance and want to make sure they know what to do if they need care, would you recommend that as we try to identify, let's say, a primary care physician, that we work through someone at WashU to help us sort of navigate the local options, or do we really need to do that outside of WashU's uh, facilities? So I would say that this is completely out, out of my area of expertise. The question is, should there be, uh, should the student identify a primary uh, care physician here in St. Louis? Um, I would, ooh, this is something I think that um, Habit Healthcare would, could be helpful as well, the health, the student health center, because they can let you know sort of what the process is if a student has, you know, a, a chronic problem, uh, you know, occasional visits they need to make or something that needs to be monitored. That, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to give advice for that because 
um, you know, I'm in the academic arena. However, we are a hub for healthcare in St. Louis. We have this excellent WashU Medical School and uh, BJC uh, system. So if you're looking for healthcare options, there are, there are many of them here. Um, but I, I don't want to give that advice myself. I, I don't feel qualified. So really, I encourage you to uh, speak to Habith. Uh, health center. Also, the previous panel had um, Kirk Dewar, who is uh, a associate vice chancellor for student wellness. He might be a, a contact for that. Uh, and I can give you his name afterward if you're interested. What was the process for assigning academic advisors to the students? Yes, yeah, so the process for assigning academic advisors is some advisors come, uh, are uh, uh, most um, advisees are assigned sort of randomly it, it generated. Some advisees are assigned to advisors if the advisee is in a particular scholarship program or in an ampersand program in some sort of um, significant cohort uh, experience where they where they would be with other advisees from that program. Otherwise, it's it's fairly fairly random. the The idea being, of course, that four year advisors are not experts in a particular area. They are there for that holistic experience uh, and for that sort of well-rounded. So the students will get those expert advisors in particular majors or minors, or if they want to, if they're interested in being pre-health, they'll get expert advisors. But this is the person that's supposed to have that large bird's eye view of the whole experience. And for that reason, we actually don't believe one advisor is better for a particular student than another advisor. We only assign some because of cohorts so that the same students in a program have the same advisor. Uh, if, if on choosing a, uh, a class, in your experience, how much weight should students give to professor's evaluation and, and, and how much to take with a grain of, sand, of salt the, the, the professor evaluation? And given that the decision is going to be hers, not mine. So did you say professor's reputation is- No, no. E evaluation. Oh, evaluations, yes. yes so um, I would say that often you may not know when you're choosing a class who is going to be t uh, teaching that class uh, because the faculty member may not have been assigned at the time of registration. So I would say the first thing the student does is, is the student interested in the topic? Is, is this an important class for the student? Um, Evaluations can be helpful, although um, most of us know that evaluations, student evaluations of faculty are heavily biased. Uh, they're biased in terms of gender, in terms of, of race, in terms of international uh, status. So we tend to take student evaluations, their information for us. They can give students information on the kind of the relative workload or the kinds of activities maybe that were in the class because those are in the evaluation. But I would say, unless a student has heard from another student that a particular faculty member is one to avoid, and I hope we don't have such faculty members uh, uh, in arts and sciences, then I don't think that that should be the main source of information. Because as we know, some people click with uh, some faculty and other people don't. In fact, you, if you see some evaluations, you'll see one person saying, this is the best professor I've ever had. And then another person says, I really didn't like this professor. And I'm not sure how you, synthesize that. So um, the advisors can help with that, although we are more interested in thinking about the curriculum and the student's path rather than that, you know, will you like the professor or not? Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, can a student have a hand in picking their departmental advisor? You know, for example, the faculty members operating in an area of interest to the student? Yeah, um, that depends on the department. The question was, I'm sorry, I have to do this for the recording. I have to repeat the question. The question was, do the students have a hand in choosing their faculty advisor for a major or minor? It depends on the department. Um, in some departments, in my own home department, 
we allow a student to mention, you know, is there a particular person you would like to be your advisor? And we try, if possible, to pair that student. It may not always be possible if there are, the advisor already has a, a, a large number of advisees. In other departments, uh, you know, biology, which is a pretty massive, uh, our biggest major, I don't think it's it, it's it's realistic for a student to choose their own advisor. Um, but, uh, you know, generally speaking, um, I think, the, the people who do the major and minor advising, they they tend to be within the area that the student's interested in. That that thought is put into um, it, into place, you know, as advisors are put into place with that thought in mind of what the particular area the student wants to go into. Yeah, so I was just going to add that even in a larger department such as biology, there are a lot of subfields, right, yeah. within biology. And so if I'm a student who wants to study neuroscience, they're going to match me with an advisor who him or herself is also a neuroscientist. That's right. Yes. Thank you again for a, an informative session. What would you say or what have you found to be the number one complaint from freshman students, both on the academic side and the non-academic side? So the number one complaint on the academic side and the, yeah. Uh, number one complaint, well, I would say, I think students are surprised at the, the, the rapid movement of courses. You know, um, it's a kind of a flipped model from high school. High school, you do a lot of the work in the classroom and you do less work outside the classroom. College is flipped, right? You have those precious, in a normal course, it's three hours a week, those precious hours with the faculty member. And then there's a lot of homework, preparation, studying outside. I think students are surprised by that and by, you know, this is what you're learning on day one. And suddenly three weeks later, it's like Zoom, you've moved through a lot of material. I think um, that the pace is surprising to students. And then the other, the other question, I'm not, that what was non-academic non-academic uh non-academic things that surprise them i think students are a little surprised that they have to be the ones who you know regulate their own schedule and they have to be the ones who you know put in that self-discipline to say no to whatever you know i don't know in my day it was hacky sack i don't know what students do now <laughs> video games and and to actually sit down and study. Like they they have to be that self-driver. I think that's a little surprising. I don't know if you guys have any things that you would think that that students are surprised by. One thing that they're not complaining about is the Tempur-Pedic mattresses. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> when they sleep, they get a good night's sleep on those Tempur-Pedic mattresses. That's right. But I do think that idea of... Um, I don't say it's complained, but it's maybe more of a confusion. Like, what does it mean to prepare for class? Yeah. Um, and that flipped classroom idea that Dean McLaughlin was just talking about, I think, is is really is really key. That you just don't sort of walk in and be like, "Well, I'm a sponge now. Entertain me, right?" You go ahead and you you do the work. You wrestle with the problems. You pre-read. Then you go to class and it's sort of taken to a next level. And I think that that has a lot to do with the pace too, yeah. right? If you weren't ready to go to the next level, it's going to feel like it's moving quickly. If you're doing the preparation and knowing what it means to do the work beforehand, mm -hmm. you're right along there with them. Yeah. And I would say that it is typical for a student, actually, it's an expectation that a student will spend two to three, and usually it's three times the amount of time outside of class working on you know, studying, doing homework, doing assignments uh, that they spend in class. So for a three hour class per week, they should be spending nine hours, uh, about nine hours on homework, studying, et cetera. That is surprising to students because they have not had that, that kind of ratio uh, in the past. So I think we have time for maybe one more question and then we'll wrap up and I think um, people will stick around for um, a couple minutes to answer any other questions. Um, does do we have one more last question? Are students given some guidelines or some guidance rather as far as managing academic stress levels, which I'm sure at a school like this run run pretty high? 
Yeah, so the question is, are students given guidelines for managing academic stress levels? Um, this is something, and I, I didn't see the presentation before by uh, student affairs, but this is something that student affairs especially takes very seriously um, in the residential halls, the RAs, the WUSAs are there to help students to think about how to sustainably manage their load. Um, it's something that I, as a faculty member, when I'm teaching, I also talk to students about, you know, we're, we're moving into midterm. How is everybody doing? Here's some things to think about. Um, so I think we're all aware of it and we're all, you know, doing what we can. Also, our four-year advisor, that's a, a, a quick contact for a student. If the student is having trouble managing either the load itself or the stress from the load, we definitely want our students checking in with us because we can find those resources. We can give some advice. You know, generally speaking, what we're finding is our students aren't prioritizing their sleep, their diet, and their exercise. And those are the first three things we, we don't want. They're the first three things that go and the first three things we wanna get back. So my we wanna get students to, you know, always thinking, yes, you have this big, you know, physics exam coming up, but you still need to take 45 minutes and get on the treadmill because that's going to help you deal with that. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we we are aware throughout the WashU community that there are moments in which our students um, are particularly stressed out, and we we're we do our part to kind of notice it and try to try to speak to students about it. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you. Let's give a big um, thank you to Dean Hu and Vice Dean McLaughlin. Thank you all. Good luck with this year. It's going to be a great one. And we're so excited to have your students with us. Thank you.